so I have a very personal passion behind this message and um, it's not one that you go into detail a lot about because it gets people very fired up. Next to addressing sexuality, this is the one that gets people really fired up. But I nearly went to hell in 1991. Um, I had I had been um, living in a lot of sin for a number of years, and I was I I went in. I had a deadly overdose. It by all means should have should have ended my life, and was close to that when I was brought to a pastor's wife and she was praying over me in the spirit and I was healed. But I had um, pretty sustained psychosis by then from drugs and alcohol, so I didn't know what was real anymore. I didn't know what of my life was real, but I had come to a decision that hell could not possibly be worth, worse than what I was experiencing in my life because the torment was so sustained in my mind that I didn't have a sense of reality. But what came out of that, even though I have no memory of that period of time, I only know what that pastor's wife told me was going on at that moment. And that graphic, she said it was a terrible thing to watch, was by all explanation of her, I was, I was being pulled into hell. And she said um, it, it was terrible. That's when she started praying in the spirit. And what came out of that when I, when I, was I came to and was just miraculously well and have been ever since 30 years ago I have this impression on me about hell that I can't tie to a memory because I don't have one I just know that I have an urgency in me to warn people about going there because what she described to me very was very real and I just was um, unconscious at the time so I don't have a memory of it you can read um, my full story on our website but it was a very traumatic situation for me and that it continues to drive my choices now that I understand a lot about life and mental health and trauma and things like that I I know it was as traumatic as as I think it was because my decision-making is still coming up out of that time frame of my life but hell is very misunderstood and it's also very mistaught. And I want to give some clarity to what the Bible says about hell because the Bible is the source of truth according to God. And that's where we need to go to get our answers. Hell is eternal and it's too long. Eternity is too long to treat this casually or to not be sure about what hell is. Jesus left heaven, came to earth as a man, died a terrible death to give us a way to not go there. That's how urgent it was to him. It's a very big deal to God. It cost him everything to come here, create a plan, and make a way for us to not go there. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming, was to keep us out of hell. That's how big of a deal hell is to them. This was an act of love and mercy that God did not have to do for us. So when people say, God wouldn't this, God wouldn't that, God wouldn't send anyone to hell. No, God wouldn't do that. God actually went through a terrible ordeal of his own to spare us going to hell. That's mercy. That's his great love for us. Matthew 7, 14 says, Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it shows that very few people really want to know or really seek to understand the actual path to heaven. And it says very few will find it because people don't want to find it. I have found that out. People don't want to find it. When you start to tell them about it, they start to get resistant and they tell you, I don't really want to hear that. And then John 3.19 states why. Why people rage against the talk of hell. It says, and this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light and men and their way, their works were evil and evil is usually thought of as something morally wrong sinful or wicked but the word evil also can refer to anything that causes harm or is without moral dimension it's used both ways in the bible but it's anything that contradicts the holiness of god Evil behavior includes sin committed against other people, 
but also evil committed against God, idolatry, blasphemy. Evil is a lack of goodness. Some say God's too loving to punish eternally and, and to allow his children to suffer forever in hell. It's true at death that his own, his children, the redeemed, are received to everlasting rest, while the unrepentant go to their father, the devil, to receive the wages of sin, which is death. God wills not the death of any, and the whole point of the whole message of the Bible is that God does not want anyone to go to hell. To reject the life that he is offering is to accept death. To reject heaven is to accept hell. There's just no other alternative. The Bible does not give any other options. And there's over 162 references in the New Testament alone that warn about hell. And over 70 of these references were spoken by Jesus himself. And those who reject the offer to escape hell, according to the Bible, they're not children of God. They have chosen to follow the way of the devil. They're actually children of the devil, according to Jesus. And we shouldn't be shocked at God. We should be shocked at anyone who is willing to gamble with such a great price paid for their sin. They know Jesus was murdered for them, but they want to stand along some kind of non-existent fence that they want to get as much sin as it, into their life as they can without that sin that will cost me hell. People are always playing with a line that is simply not there. Hell is a place of torment. Jesus says of the man in Luke 16, 23, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, for I am tormented in this flame. It is humanly impossible to comprehend what the Bible describes as hell. Nothing on earth can compare to it. No nightmare can produce the terror that would match what the Bible speaks about as hell. You can see it, breathe it, hear it, and feel it. The horror of hell, even for one second, is unbearable, and it's eternal. It lasts forever. There's no way to get out of it. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me into everlasting fire. That's what happens to those who reject Jesus Christ, all of them. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. What could possibly be worth choosing eternity in hell? No wonder Jesus warned so much about hell. He came to warn us about hell. And no wonder Jesus said Mark in Mark 8, 36, for what shall it profit a man if he would gain the whole world and lose his own soul. People don't realize that gold is pavement in heaven. Money is worth nothing in heaven, but people will run themselves ragged, commit their whole life to acquiring money and things when it equals nothing. It's cement, the equal, equal to cement in heaven. Jesus took hell very seriously. He says in Mark 9, 43 to 47, and if your hand offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. And if your foot offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life than halt than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that will never be quenched. And if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. When I was working in the jails back, it was probably in the early 2000s, I met a young man. He was sitting there talking to me. He was probably, I would say, around 30 maybe. But he's talking to me, but he had his hand, he had a straight his, he was minus his hand. It was cut straight off. Like it was a straight cut off. He had no hand. And I was watching his hand because, you know, he talked with that arm, but he had no hand. And I could see it wasn't a birth defect because it was a straight cut off. And so eventually I asked him, I said, can I ask you what happened to your hand? Because he was passionately talking about Jesus to me. And he said he was smoking crack cocaine. He was addicted to crack cocaine. And he said he just couldn't stop. He was just so addicted he couldn't stop. But he was reading his Bible 
a lot, but he couldn't stop smoking crack. So he read these verses and he said he took out a big knife and he cut his hand off so that he would stop smoking crack because he said, I didn't want to go to hell. And I knew if I kept smoking crack cocaine, I was going to go to hell. So I cut off my hand so I would stop smoking crack cocaine. And I'll never forget the impact of that on me because I'd never seen anyone take that literally like that. I certainly don't advise that. I would advise a, a different, all sorts of different ways to stop sinning. But this young man, his passion to get it right for God, I've, ne I've never forgotten him. Now he lives in a group home because he cut off his dominant hand, the one that he needs, and he's having a lot of other issues with life because that wasn't the only sin he had but i really was i was really startled by that story to be honest the story of the church for nearly 2000 years has been has been god's love for a lost world and his provision that we would be redeemed he has proven that with his love yet he's not indulgent and he does not wink at sin he is very just and he won't allow us to transgress his holy law forever. He warns of judgment before, even before the very first transgression in the garden. He was already warning. Warns of impending doom flash like fire through the whole Bible. And you can act like they aren't there or they aren't for today, but they're in the word and the word stands forever and we will be judged accordingly. So you can ignore it, but that will be shown on judgment day that you chose to ignore it. They were and are there to be seen in the end. And hell is a place of total, conscious, eternal separation from God. And if a person rejects God throughout life, never submitting to him in repentance, then that person will enter eternity after death without God by choice. The lake of fire is mentioned throughout Revelation in multiple different places. It's described as the second death where all the unrighteous will be sent. Revelation 19.20 tells us the beast and its false prophet, the Antichrist, will be thrown into the lake of fire for a final punishment of evil. And after God's judgment seated on a white throne, anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire by their own choice, not God's choice. He gave up everything so that we wouldn't have to go there. And this is a place that is reserved for Satan and his demons, not intended for God's beloved creation, us. Multiple scriptures confirm that God does not want anyone to perish in this final judgment, but wants anyone and everyone to repent from sin and to follow Jesus. And from the oldest book in the Bible, Job, to the last book, Revelation, hell has been given very consistent characteristics. The first being darkness. Darkness is consistently associated with hell. Often when people have a vision of hell, it's black, like a black you can't even see through. It's just solid black. Job writes of a land of deepest night, of utter darkness and disorder, a realm of darkness, even a day of darkness. Other references throughout the Bible include realm of darkness, thrown outside into darkness, and blackest darkness, plunged into darkness. Darkness is a continuous theme. Two, gnashing of teeth is another common, um, consistent um, characteristic of hell. Jesus, who spoke about hell more than anyone else in the whole Bible, used this phrase to describe the intense suffering in hell. Gnashing means binding and grinding. And if you choose to reject this, you also are calling Jesus a liar because he's the one who said it. And Jesus warned people about this place where there will be gnashing of teeth. That means binding and grinding of your teeth continuously forever. Three, fire. Isaiah in the Old Testament prophesied about hell as a place where the fire that burns them will never be quenched. This unquenchable fire is also referenced in Mark and other fire references throughout the Bible include blazing furnace in Matthew, fire of hell in Matthew, eternal fire in Matthew, tormented with fire and brimstone in Revelation. In Luke 16, Jesus gives a frightening picture of hell in starting in verse 22. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, 
have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus received evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this between us, there is a great gulf, so that they which would pass from you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from being this gulf between the two, you can't cross back and forth. Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them that they would also not come to this place of torment. The man in Luke 16, 24 cries, I am tormented in this flame. In Matthew 13, 42, Jesus says, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Depart from me into everlasting fire. Revelation 20, 15 says, And whosoever is not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Number four, common, consistent thing of hell is a separation from God. Often without knowing it, both the redeemed and the unrepentant experience God's blessing on earth. There's just blessings here for all. Hell, however, is eternal separation from God's presence, love, and any other blessings. And in the Bible, there are passages describing the reality of hell as separation from God, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might in 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Matthew 25.41, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25.46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Bible actually gives the location of hell. And I often hear people tell me that this earth is hell, that they feel like hell is somehow something that they're experiencing here, that it's a here and now thing. And that is very far from the truth. The Bible contradicts that. Jesus himself contradicts that. One of you is wrong. When Jesus died on the cross, he descended into hell, it says. In Acts 2, Peter is speaking, verse 31, seeing this before, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. When Jesus died, his soul went into hell. And in Matthew 12, 40, Jesus Christ says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Bible says hell is inside the earth. Ephesians 4, 9 says of Jesus, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? In the book, Beyond Death's Door, Dr. Rawlings said, patients who describe hell said, this place seems to be underground or within the earth in some way. In the Birmingham News, April 10, 1987, there was an article entitled, Earth's Center Hotter Than the Sun's Surface, scientists say. The article stated that scientists have recently discovered the Earth's inner core has a temperature of over 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Have you seen a volcano erupting, spewing a lake of fire from inside the earth? It consumes everything within miles with just the heat. When Mount St. Helen erupted in May 18 of 1980, it was described by reporters as when hell surfaced upon the earth. In the book Volcanoes, Earth's Awakening, it also describes as an erupting volcano as a descent into hell. Thousands of years ago, the Bible described a place called hell in the heart of the earth that matches exactly what science is now discovering. Brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation. What is brimstone? Sulfur. And do you know where sulfur or brimstone is found? Inside the earth. And according to the book Volcanoes by Pierre Kohler, when Mount St. Helen erupted in 1980, 150,000 tons of sulfurous gas was ejected. Job, he's the oldest book in the Bible, written over 3,000 years ago, yet Job knew what science didn't know for years, that inside this earth is brimstone. Hell is forever. In a few verses referenced in Matthew, Mark, the Bible is very clear that hell is everlasting. It has no end. Why must torment in hell go on forever 
Author Russell Moore offers two reasons why hell is eternal. One, sin is far more serious than we want to realize. Humanity's rebellion against God is more serious than we are willing to acknowledge. An insurrection against an infinitely holy and worthy creator is an infinitely heinous offense. Two, sin does not disappear. Those in hell do not love the Lord their God with all their hearts, their souls, and their mind, according to Matthew 22, 37, but are completely handed over to the fullness of human nature without God's grace. The condemnation continues for eternity because so does their sin. Hell is a final handing over, according to Romans 1, of a rebel who he wants to be, and it is forever. All who enter hell abandon all hope. We know from Romans 3.23 that everyone who has sinned and therefore stands condemned before a holy God. But John 3.16-17 tells us that because of God's great love for the whole world, he stepped in to rescue people from this helpless future. If only they will trust in Jesus Christ the Messiah. This rescue is not forced, but it's received by grace through faith. And should someone die without faith in God, the Bible says their sin condemned them to hell, not God. The Bible does not indicate further opportunity to receive salvation after a person dies on this earth. Jesus told a parable illustrating this in Luke 16, 19 to 31. In verse 26, we spoke of that great chasm between heaven and hell, meaning in Hades at that time, meaning a place of the dead that is set in place so that no one can cross from one side to the other. Alistair Begg posed the question, is Jesus Christ true in what he says? If Jesus Christ is Lord, then I have to believe exactly what he taught, Begg said. If we start from that premise, then we can't simply take out the hard parts of it. We've got to take him at his word. The most loving person who has ever lived spoke so straightforwardly about the awfulness of hell. We need to listen. God is clear about who will populate hell. False prophets and teachers, he lists. Author Tim Challies writes of the seven marks of false teachers, and I want to give a description of this part especially because according to the Bible in the last days, there are going to be many, many false teachers showing up on the front, and we are seeing that. This gospel that's being put out to pretty much the whole world at this point is so neutered. It is such a false gospel. It is void of all of its power. It is void of what is really expected. And God is very serious that if there's anyone who is speaking for him that is sharing this version of the gospel, the price is going to be very severe. They're choosing to serve flesh, something that they want in return. But in doing so, they're leading many to hell who actually like their version of the gospel because it doesn't require a sacrifice of self. So people do listen to them. They're responsible for that because they know in their heart there's got to be more to this, but they like that a minister is sharing something with them that they can blame on the speaker. But both are going to, it's going to have a very severe end for both. Those who do this who neuter the message the gospel message of the bible are promised hell and a much worse penalty than if they had simply stayed out of ministry and not spoke for god and i'm urgent as one who speaks for jesus to warn all of us that people look to as a voice for the kingdom that you either speak the clear truth according to the bible or you step out because you will be very sorry one day for what it will cost you. And it's going to be a terrible day when you realize the consequences of speaking loving and encouraging ways and words to people when their sin needed to be confronted. And we see this a lot when people stop addressing sexual immorality and just start applauding people who are having children out of wedlock. We see that a lot. We have got to confront sin because there is no chance that there's a blessing of God on that. The poor child is is going to suffer the consequences of the sins of the parents. The child didn't sin, the parents did. But we as ministers of the gospel should never, never um, try to put something, um, we should speak the truth 
When someone is in sin, we should love them enough to speak the truth that if they do not repent, they're, they're going in a very bad direction, the wrong way from heaven. Here's the, here's the um, what this author said are what a false teacher is. Number one, false teachers are man pleasers. What they teach is meant to please the ear more than to profit the heart. They tickle the ears of their followers with flattery and all the while they treat holy things with wit and carelessness rather than reverence and awe. And this contrasts sharply with a true teacher of the word who knows that he will answer to God and who is therefore more eager to please God than man. And as Paul would say, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. First Thessalonians 2, 4. Number two, false teachers save their harshest criticism for God's most faithful servants. False teachers criticize those who teach the truth and save their sharpest criticism for those who hold steadfast to what is true. And we see this in many places in the Bible, such as when Korah and his friends rose up against Moses and Aaron, and when Paul's ministry was threatened and undermined by critics who said that while his words were strong, he himself was weak and unimportant in 2 Corinthians 10.10. And we see it most notably in the vicious attacks of the religious authorities against Jesus himself when he was here on earth. False teachers continue to rebuke and belittle God's faithful servants today. And as Augustine declared, he that willingly takes from my good name unwillingly adds to my reward. Three, false teachers teach their own wisdom and vision. And this was certainly true in the days of Jeremiah when God would say, the prophets are prophes prophesying lies in my name. I did not speak to them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds, Jeremiah 14, 14. And today, too, false teachers teach the foolishness of mere men instead of teaching the deeper, richer wisdom of God. And Paul knew the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 2 Timothy 4.3, and again, the price to the teacher will be hell. Four, false teachers miss what is of central importance and focus instead on the small details. Jesus diagnosed this very tendency in the false teachers of his day, warning them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Matthew 23, 23. False teachers place great emphasis on their adherence to the smaller commands, even as they ignore the greater ones. And Paul warned Timothy, one of who was puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels without words, which produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. 1 Timothy 6, 4 through 5. Number five, false teachers obscure their false doctrine with eloquent speech and what appears to be impressive logic. Just as a prostitute paints and perfumes herself to appear more attractive and more alluring, the false teacher hides his blasphemies and dangerous doctrine behind powerful arguments and eloquent use of language. He offers to his listeners the spiritual equivalent of a poisonous pill coated in gold. Though it may appear beautiful and valuable, it is deadly. Six, false teachers are more concerned with winning others to their opinions rather than helping them and bettering them, and certainly helping them to acquire heaven for eternity. This was another of Jesus' diagnoses as he considered the religious leaders of his day. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Matthew 23, 15. False teachers are ultimately not in the business of bettering lives and saving souls, but convincing minds and winning followers.
that's their pursuit. And number seven, false teachers exploit their followers. Peter would warn of this danger saying, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And in their greed, they will exploit you. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3. The false teachers exploit those who follow them because they are greedy and they desire riches in this world. And this being true, will always teach principles that indulge the flesh. False teachers are concerned with your goods, not your good. They want to serve themselves more than save the lost. They are content for Satan to have your soul as long as they can have your stuff. They're looking for those who have a lot of resources. They're going to treat those far better than the ones that they're supposed to protect and serve. A group also promised hell are the wicked, the atheist, the hypocrite, those who forget God, the unbeliever, the heathen, the idolater, and those who won't forgive. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 13, 42, he repeats the same thing. What if he's right? What if Jesus is right? And here's the good news. God does not want you in hell. Hell was not made for humans. Matthew 25, 41 says, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels because God is a God of love and he loved you so much. He sent his son Jesus to this earth to die a cruel death on a cross to pay the price as a holy God for what he demands from our sin. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commanded commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He had already made a way. God does not send someone to hell. You choose hell by rejecting Jesus. And when you refuse God's love and his gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ, you're accepting a future away from him. The time has come, Jesus said in Mark 1:15. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Hell is a choice for each person there. Millionaire Ted Turner said in an interview, I'm looking forward to dying and being cast into hell. That's where I belong. And you might say he's a fool, but he is one of many who choose to resist what is required to enter heaven. He just speaks it. Actually, quite a few people speak it. I hear from quite a few. If I go to hell because my friends will be there, as if they're going to be able to see them. You're telling God, I don't need Jesus. I've got a way to pay for my own sins, or my sins aren't that bad. If you reject God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. What sin could possibly be worth eternity in hell? I say this often to the sexually immoral. I'm not one who can judge others. I have been, I have done, I have sinned far more than I care to admit. But sexually immoral, porn addiction, identifying as a sexual being is prohibited as a child of God. And when you hold on to that right, you're you're putting yourself out of bounds of being a son or daughter of the Most High. You've set yourself apart. And I tell people that better be worth it because hell for eternity is a very big price to pay. Plus, you're, if you have a partner in that, you're also bringing them with you. Jesus said in Mark 8.36, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And we see men giving many things in exchange for their soul. Sex, power, greed, a position in a church, religion, reputation. We see many things. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God has something far better than words can describe for those who love him. 
um, verse Corinthians 2, 9 says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And don't wait until you die to find out the truth about hell because tomorrow is not promised for a lot of people. Proverbs 27, 1 says, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you do not know what tomorrow holds. Three people die every, sec every second, 180 every minute, and since I started pe speaking, 2,000 more people have gone into eternity. Auto accidents, heart attacks, strokes. One thing is certain, you are going to die today, tomorrow, in a month, a year, five years, 10 years, but one thing is certain, it is appointed unto man once to die, and do not die without Jesus Christ. Many have no final warning. You may have made terrible mistakes in your life and there may be things in your life that you're unable to change, that you would give anything to change. But I can assure you, if you die without Jesus Christ, it will be the worst mistake you can possibly make. And if there has never been a time and a place when you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and chose to abandon and forsake your sin and your rights to yourself and focus on a walk of obedience with Jesus in your life, you're on your way to hell. Jesus is the one to ask. It's his house and he determines who enters and he is clear. You must be born again. Jesus says that. If you're not born again, you are not coming to his home in heaven. If you have not given over all rights to your own life, you are not going to heaven. You're on the way to hell according to Jesus himself. Don't let anyone convince you that when you die, everything's over. The Bible says in Hebrews 9:27, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Revelation 20:15 says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Nothing is worth taking that chance. The first mention of not inheriting the kingdom of God is found in Paul's letter to Corinth, the church of Corinth. So this is the church he wrote this to. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, which is any type of sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. I was telling the ladies, I, I uh, was speaking to someone today who was leaving treatment to go back to where he was living. And he called to talk to me because he wanted some help finding a place to live because he lived with his girlfriend. And he said, I've already told her we can't have sex anymore. I don't want to go to hell. I will go to hell if we keep having sex and if I'm a drunkard and I can't be around there because I will keep drinking and drunkards and the sexually immoral will go to hell. And God made that clear to me that I will go to hell if I keep doing those two things. This is a man who has boasted many, many years in the church knowing the Bible very well. I've known him for a long time, but this was what he shared with me today. He knows clearly from God that he cannot continue being a drunk and he cannot continue sleeping with his girlfriend. He has to leave both. He believes the Bible. He read the Bible and he believes it. Something else other people should do. Don't believe what you hear from people. Believe the Bible. By saying the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, Paul is stating that the wicked are not children of God, nor are they heirs of eternal life, according to Romans 8, 17. This does not mean that anybody who has ever committed one of these sins will be denied entrance to heaven. What separates a Christian's life from a non-Christian is a struggle against sin and the ability to overcome it. A true Christian will always repent and will, will eventually return to God and will always resume the struggle against sin. But the Bible gives no support that a person who repeatedly and unrepentantly engages in sin can be a Christian. The first Corinthians passage lists sins that if indulging continuously, identify a person as not being redeemed by Christ. The Christian's response, the genuine Christian's response to sin is to hate it, repent of it, and forsake it, which means abandon it. We still struggle with sin, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, 
we're able to resist and overcome sin. The hallmark of a true Christian is the decreasing presence of sin in their life as they grow and mature in faith, which is required. Sin has less and less of a hold on us. Sinless perfection is impossible, but our hatred for sin becomes greater as we mature. It has to be going that way. My little friend Shaylee sent me a video Sunday, I think it was, of a woman sharing a vivid vision that she had of going to hell. She identified as a Christian, at, didn't have feel any risk of hell, but she reports on God's mercy, his great love and mercy for her to warn her. He took her in a vision to hell. Everything she says about it, support the Bible supports her version of it, the darkness, the fire, the the just torment. She reported seeing many who identified as Christians here on earth. But what God showed her was that he had named some things that were not going to be tolerated amongst children of God. And she had not chosen, she refused to forgive some people that were close to her that had hurt her. She refused to forgive them. And he showed her, you will not go to heaven until you forgive them. There was something that God had prohibited as a child of God that she had stood in opposition to, and hers was unforgiveness. She was refusing to forgive some who had hurt her, and she was allowed that vision she feels out of great love and mercy so that she could choose to forgive, walk in forgiveness, and then become bound for heaven. Here is how to be saved. You have got to realize that you're a sinner and admit it. As it is written in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, you cannot save yourself. Isaiah 64.6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, meaning whatever we feel is good about us is filthy before God. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. 1 Peter 2, 24, realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on that tree. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You can have the assurance of salvation when you believe that salvation is nothing that you can do, but God's act of redemption in Jesus Christ conceived before the foundation of the world. He made a plan for us to be restored and redeemed before he ever put us here. At the day of Jesus Christ, this work of grace is not merely about conversion, but salvation is seen by the Apostle Paul as a magnificent divine series of deliverances. Deliverance from unbelief, from the grip of the devil, from our flesh, from the world, from death, and from a fallen world, and finally, from final judgment from hell. It reaches its triumph in the second coming of Christ with the new heavens and the new earth. We have the assurance of eternal life going forward. Also unspeakable, unspeakable what that will be like. However, if you're not setting things right and getting on the right foot, making amends with God and doing all of this on your terms, kind of um, scripting your own way of getting to heaven, if it's up to you and it's up to this prayer that you prayed and you're basing your salvation on something that you did, if you began it, you will fail. You won't go to heaven. It angers God when someone feels that there's something they can do that is seen as good, holy, or righteous apart from a complete work on the cross by Jesus only. We have to receive the gift of God in Christ, our sins covered by his life and his sacrifice on the cross. He bore the punishment of our sin. He was the perfect sacrifice. And he who begins a good work in us, if he begins it, he will complete it. If you begin it, you will lose it. Make sure that you aren't trusting in a prayer as your ticket to heaven without the Holy Spirit and a a very dramatic change in you. 
that prayer is void. If God is the author of your salvation, nothing will ever undo the finished work of God in Christ applied to your life through the Holy Spirit. He seals it. Salvation is based on Christ's person, not on us. And when Paul told the Philippians that he was confident that he who began a good work in you will see it through until the day of Christ, he was affirming that salvation is not only of God, but in Christ. God's covenant of grace is the sacred bond in the blood that what God requires, God provides in the person of his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is our righteousness, our substitute, our advocate, and our high priest. He is everything. He is all of it. God provided all of it. The father made a covenant with the son to save us before the foundation of the world for his pleasure, not because of anything good that was in us. He sent his son to live the life that we could never live and die the death that we should have died, that we deserve to die. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son and with the Father and the Son is glorified as he carries out that divine plan in each of us who will receive him. The cross becomes a crown. The sign of shame that it was is now a sign of salvation. The darkness of the tomb becomes a glow of resurrection that is now working in power in our life. You can tell when a person's born again. I was a sinner for a long time. I knew, I knew who they were. I steered clear of them, but I knew why too. I knew, I knew that my spirit opposed them. I know why people say they don't wanna see me. Well, there's many reasons, but I know sometimes the spiritual battle involved there. Matthew 27, 50 through 53 says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. For those who feel like they can't stop sinning, This shows you the power that's available to us to stop sinning. It raised a bunch of people from the dead and they walked into the city. This is the power that is available to us. So any excuses that are made to that I can't stop this certain sin is going to fall so flat on judgment day because of the power available in the Holy Spirit to stop sinning is so great. It goes so far past what we would possibly ever need. It's the creative force of God. Trust me, it can stop any sin. You will be forced to see, and many know now, I've been there, that you don't stop sinning because you love your sin more than you love Jesus. That's why you're still sinning. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John 6, 37, 39 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. John 11, 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John 10, 28 to 29. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. That to me is what keeps us here. Is that we know whatever it is that keeps coming to our door to tear us apart they will never win, they never have. We have a protector that wins every battle. Romans 8, 38 to 39, for I am sure that neither death death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. First John 5:11 through 13, 
And this is a testimony that God gave us eternal life. This life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Simply by faith you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Faith is something that everyone exercises. I know it seems like this um, mystic word, but we trust the sun will rise. We also trust in love, and that's not like a tangible thing. I used to, when I was in the institutions, I would tell the guys who would tell me I don't have any faith and I would tell them to go outside the room and walk back in just like they did before and they'd walk back in and they'd sit down in their chair and, and look at me like what now and I'd say well interestingly you didn't turn that chair upside down and check the bolts and to make sure that chair wasn't going to collapse on you because somebody could have come in and taken all the the screws out of that chair and it could have gone completely to pieces when you sat on it but you had faith that that wasn't going to happen so you do have faith you had faith that this place wasn't going to leave a broken chair in here for you to sit on and fall on the floor faith to be an addict takes a lot it does take a lot of faith to be an addict because we take this liquid or we take drugs and we don't do it because the ingesting is so um, fun we know it's going to produce an effect that you can't see by looking at that substance, but our faith in that substance tells us we're gonna get something from that that we want. So faith is something that we are all very capable of. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 2. Acts 16, 30 to 31 says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. There are three steps to true repentance to be saved. First, conviction. The Holy Spirit will reveal the areas in which we've sinned and convict us of wrongdoing. Trust me, he will. I, if you're listening, he will. And it, and it is right down to the, your thought life. Through the Bible, the Spirit shows us God's standard and what needs to change. Repentance begins with an understanding that we have gone astray and we need to return back. Next is contrition. The next step is grieving over our iniquity. That's followed by confession to God and, and also, it, even stronger to others who will help you. Genuine sorrow arises from the knowledge that we've sinned against God. And in contrast, human unhappiness often comes when we're caught for misbehaving. They're very different. Other times we're miserable because of our choices. They've led us to shame and broken relationships. But true contrition, the kind required for salvation, is having offended God. A very deep sorrow over having offended God and followed by a humble confession. The next part is a commitment to act. You have to act on it. And real repentance is complete when we wholeheartedly pledge to turn from our old behavior and move towards righteousness. And God knows we won't live perfectly, but he looks for a heart that is surrendered to his and that diligently wants to obey him and makes choices to come back to him when we don't quickly repent. We commit to make one choice to make all future choices for Jesus Christ. Never hesitate to reach out to me about this. This is the calling on my life is evangelism. That is my first calling. Speaking the truth according to the word is a close second. I am not allowed to compromise the truth at, for any reason. And for as many different pieces as this ministry has seemed to had come in on it, we are abandoning all of it to focus on the truth and to help people find freedom in Jesus Christ. All we want is to share Jesus and not have our time tied up by other things. It is that important because that's what God is asking us to do. So never hesitate to reach out to us. If you want prayer, freedom, we are all about helping people find freedom in Jesus Christ. 
You can pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And unless you save me, I'm lost forever. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I come to you now the best way I know how and ask you to save me. I now receive you as Lord and Savior. God, I praise you for saving me through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. I understand that you have not saved me as a result of anything about my own works, but you have saved me through grace. Therefore, my life will remain dedicated to praise your name. I will praise you always for saving me through grace. I ask for more grace to remain faithful to you. Do not let me abuse my salvation with sin. Help me to live a sanctified life that will remain fit for your kingdom. Empower me through your Holy Spirit to keep my focus on you, Jesus, and to remain serving you until the end of my life so that I can meet you in heaven. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen.